driving to the beach today, I was listening to the Beach Boys, a native California band from the 60s who were known for being surfers. Of course, anything to do with the beach gets me thinking about one of my favorite subjects, the mythical lost continent of Atlantis, which to me is much more than a myth and while I approach the subject academically, I'm also well aware of much of the non-conventional information pertaining to Atlantis, most notably from an American psychic who passed away in 1945 named Edgar Casey. Known as the Sleeping Prophet, he was given the nickname because he would allegedly channel from his higher self while asleep in a trance-like state. His words were recorded and during the sessions, Casey would answer questions on a variety of subjects like healing, reincarnation, dreams, the afterlife, past lives, future events, and of course, Atlantis. Other abilities that have been attributed to Casey include astral projection and seeing auras. As a devout Christian and Sunday school teacher, Casey's readings were often criticized as demonic by his religious colleagues, but Casey himself believed that it was his subconscious mind exploring the dream realm where he believed all minds were timelessly connected. That said, Casey was definitely a spiritual man who believed that humans were much more than a physical body, which is clear from some of his quotes. Birth in the physical is death in the spiritual. Death in the physical is birth in the spiritual. Individuals do not meet by chance. They are necessary in the experience of others, though they may not always use their opportunities in a spiritual way or manner. A soulmate is an ongoing connection with another individual that the soul picks up again in various times and places over lifetimes. We are attracted to another person at a soul level, not because that person is our unique complement, but because by being with that individual, we are somehow provided with an impetus to become whole ourselves. In his psychic readings, Edgar Cayce made numerous references to longevity. In several life readings, in which he explained reincarnation and described prehistoric civilizations, such as Atlantis, he noted that in previous eras, the human lifespan had been much longer than in the present. He stated that it was not unusual for individuals to live to be several hundred years old. His spiritual optimism, however, was contrasted by his dark outlook concerning periodic global cataclysms. Quote, There will be a shifting of the poles. There will be upheavals in the Arctic and the Antarctic that will make for the eruption of volcanoes in the torrid areas. The upper portion of Europe will be changed in the blink of an eye. The earth will be broken up in the western portions of America. The greater portion of Japan must go into the sea. There's much material in the readings on early Atlantis. When the poles shifted and Lemuria was submerged in the Pacific, the continent began to break up. The first disturbances were attributed to the use of high-powered explosives to destroy the enormous animals that then existed. Gas pockets were blown open and volcanic eruptions followed. Several thousand years later, the second major destruction left only comparatively small island areas, the largest of which was called Poseidia or Alta. Descriptions of individual incarnations in the readings cover periods ranging from approximately 200,000 BC to about 9,500 BC, the date given as the third and final destruction, which is the same date given by Plato. It is indicated that prior to each of these destructions, there was an extensive migration to other lands, the Yucatan, the Mississippi Basin, Spain, Peru, and Egypt. A parallel seems to exist between the highly complex civilizations of Atlantis and our scientific civilization of today. Theirs was a highly scientific civilization. It was allegedly an age of electricity, like ours, with most of our modern conveniences 
and many that we have not yet achieved. The readings are full of evidence that the secrets of atomic energy were well understood. According to Casey, the Atlanteans were able, through the use of, quote, electrical and aerotic formations and the breaking up of the atomic forces to produce the impelling force to means of transportation or of lifting large weights or of changing the faces or forces of nature itself. According to Casey, the Atlanteans used a device for focusing energy from the sun, which was called the Terrible Crystal. Here's one excerpt in which it is mentioned. Quote, the entity was in Atlantis when there was the use of elements known as electrical forces today, connected with the various ways in which crafts carried individuals from place to place, what may be known in the present as photographing from a distance or the fields of activity that claim the ability for reading inscriptions through walls, and the preparations through the crystal, the mighty, terrible crystal. All of these were a portion of the entity's activity in that experience, and much of it brought destruction. The readings are full of the struggle between the spiritually enlightened, who are called the children of the Law of One, and the unawakened materialists, called the Sons of Bilal, who sought to misuse spiritual power and eventually succeeded in creating great havoc. Bilal is a Hebrew word used to characterize the wicked or worthless. The etymology of the word is often understood as lacking worth. From a Christian perspective, Bilal seems to be the personification of wickedness and evil, where the New Testament uses Bilal once as a name for what many Christians interpret as Satan. In the Old Testament, the word Bilal appears over 20 times. However, most of the instances don't refer to a specific being, so appears to be a spirit or personification of evil through people. As far as Atlantis goes, it's also stated that records of its histories have been preserved in Egypt and the Yucatan and that they will be found following the changes that will take place when part of the old continent will again emerge from the Atlantic, which was predicted to happen sometime around the year 2000. According to Casey, there's a sealed room inside of the pyramid, which will not be discovered for some time. This room contains the prophecies for the next age. Which brings me to an interesting article recently published that talks about the possibility of there being an additional, as of yet undiscovered, chamber inside of the Great Pyramid, which may have been detected using cosmic rays that regularly bombard the Earth. A giant secret chamber has been discovered in the ancient Egyptian Great Pyramid of Giza. The 100-foot long room was found using cosmic rays, particles that can be used to penetrate stone and reveal hidden, internal voids without needing to directly access the site. Scan Pyramids is a project involving an international team of researchers and launched in October 2015 under the authority of the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. Its goal was to use particle physics to probe the internal structure of the pyramids in a non-invasive way. The technology works by using muons, popularly known as cosmic rays, to detect anomalies and voids within the pyramids. Previously, the Scan Pyramids team has said their findings hint at the existence of secret, hidden chambers within the Great Pyramid. The latest findings, published in Nature, are the first to confirm the discovery of a large void within the 4,500-year-old structure. Researchers say the void they have detected measures around 100 foot in length and 26 foot in height. 
It sits directly above the Grand Gallery, a 153-foot-long room that connects the chambers of the pyramid, including the Queen's and King's chambers. The newly discovered chamber has a similar cross-section to the Grand Gallery, indicating that the two are connected. The discovery could point to a new, undiscovered chamber. Hello, I'm John Van Auken, the director of the Edgar Cayce Foundation, and I'm coming to you from our headquarters in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And as you may have heard, there has been a new discovery in the Great Pyramid in Egypt which is amazing because everyone thought we knew everything inside that pyramid, but apparently there are some surprises yet to come. So here's a depiction in this slide of the location of the new discovery. A large void, open area, no stone there, above the Grand Gallery in the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Here you see the team from Nagoya University in Japan doing a 3D projection of their discoveries. The little short red arrow points to the location inside the Great Pyramid, and as you can see, it's above the Grand Gallery. The long arrow shows the blow-up of the King's Chamber with the relieving chambers and the location of that void of stone. Here you see the team outside the Great Pyramid preparing their muon detector to enter the pyramid. Here they are again and you see the plates here that they're putting together before they enter. And here they are with muon plates laid out to detect any change in the penetration of muons in a solid structure. This technology has actually been used with volcanoes and other stone structures to detect openings. And as you can see, they found such in the Great Pyramid. Now, as we come over to this diagram created by National Geographic, and arrow number one points to where they located their detector in the Queen's Chamber. So cosmic rays hit the atmosphere and produce muons which come in and as you can see that area right there the muons moved a lot faster and were not absorbed by stone indicating an anomaly, an opening, a void. Everybody's hesitating calling it a chamber because the shape is not determined yet and they don't really know what's inside it, but they know it is an opening in the stone. It's at least 30 meters, which is about 100 feet long. Some believe it to be 125 feet by 35 feet. And it's generally considered to be above the Grand Gallery. It may even be another gallery, we don't know. So as you can see by these wonderful diagrams that these two organizations did for us, it's amazing. Somehow there is a secret opening unknown to us before inside one of the oldest, the only lasting seventh wonder of the ancient world is holding a big secret and how we're going to uh, explore it further is still a big question. Um, there's a lot of stone between the Grand Gallery and that void. As you may know, Edgar Cayce had a lot to say about the Great Pyramid and how the ancient Egyptians, particularly the early ones, going way, way back, laid out the Giza Plateau and the pyramids on the plateau, particularly the Great Pyramid, according to the arrangements of the stars above the plateau. So somehow the ancient ones had a celestial connection to a deeper truth about us. And Edgar Cayce clears that up and states straight out 
we actually are celestial beings temporarily having a terrestrial experience. When ancient Egypt is mentioned, most people think of pharaohs. But there are many Egyptian mysteries that stretch back into pre-dynastic times with underground secrets that predate the first Egyptian pharaoh and the pyramids themselves. In fact, numerous ancient writers wrote about multi-leveled underground cities beneath the pyramids and surrounding areas. Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian who is known as the father of history, described an impressive labyrinth said to have contained thousands of rooms full of hieroglyphs and paintings as well as an equal number of subterranean chambers heavily guarded and inaccessible to ordinary people. Herodotus wrote about the mysterious labyrinth, saying, This I have actually seen, a work beyond words, for if anyone put together the buildings of the Greeks and display of their labors, they would seem lesser in both effort and expense to this labyrinth. Even the pyramids are beyond words, and each was equal to many and mighty works of the Greeks, yet the labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. There I saw twelve palaces, regularly disposed, which had communication with each other, interspersed with terraces and arranged around twelve halls. It was hard to believe they are the work of man. The walls are covered with carved figures, and each court is exquisitely built of white marble and surrounded by a colonnade. Here, the corner where the labyrinth ends, there was a pyramid, 240 feet in height, with great carved figures of animals on it and an underground passage by which it can be entered. I was told very credibly that underground chambers and passages connected this pyramid with the pyramids at Memphis. Many other writers supported what Herodotus had written. One of them was Imoblicus of Apamea, a Syrian Neoplatonist philosopher who recorded in ancient times unprecedented information about an entrance into the Great Pyramid of Giza, leading directly from inside the body of the Sphinx. This entrance, obstructed in our day by sands and rubbish, may still be traced between the forelegs of the crouched colossus. It was formerly closed by a bronze gate whose secret spring could be opened only by the Magi. It was guarded by public respect, and a sort of religious fear maintained its inviolability better than armed protection would have done. In the belly of the Sphinx were cut out galleries leading to the subterranean part of the Great Pyramid. Iamblichus further explained that the historic galleries were artfully decorated along their course towards the pyramid. If one were to travel into the passages without a guide, they'd inevitably return to the starting point. It's not clear whether the Egyptian temple was described as a labyrinth simply because it was so huge and so complex that one could easily become lost, or whether it was intentionally designed as a maze where one had to find their own way through it. Ancient Greek historian Strabo also claimed to have visited the temple and wrote in his book, Before the entrances there lie what may be called hidden chambers, which are long and many in number and have paths running through one another which twist and turn so that no one can enter or leave any court without a guide. Another Greek philosopher by the name of Crantor of the Old Academy, probably born around the middle of the 4th century BC, supported the writings made by Herodotus. Crantor suggested that there was an intricate set of underground pillars set to contain written stone records of prehistoric events. Greek historian Diodorus Sicilus, 1st century BC, gives one of the most colorful descriptions. When one had entered the sacred enclosure, one found a temple surrounded by columns, 40 to each side, and this building had a roof made of a single stone carved with panels and richly adorned with excellent paintings. It contained memorials of the homeland of each of the kings as well as the temples and sacrifices carried out in it, all skillfully worked in paintings of the greatest beauty. Furthermore, writings of the first century Roman historian Pliny the Elder suggest that 
there were concealed chambers directly beneath the great Sphinx of Giza. Pliny wrote about the existence of a tomb belonging to a ruler called Harmachus. Interestingly, it is believed that the great Sphinx was once called the great Sphinx Harmachus, who mounted guard since the time of the followers of Horus. More evidence is found in the manuscript documented by Arab writer Altel M. Sani and preserved in the British Museum. He documented the existence of an extensive square underground chamber located below ground, between the Great Pyramid and the Nile River, saying that there was something enormous blocking the entrance. Altil Msani wrote, In the days of Ahmed ben Tulan, a party entered the Great Pyramid through the tunnel and found in a side chamber a goblet of a glass of rare color and texture. As they were leaving, they missed one of the party. Upon returning to seek him, he came out to them, naked and laughing, said, Do not follow or seek for me, and then rushed back into the pyramid. His friends perceived that he was enchanted. Upon learning about strange happenings under the pyramid, Ahmed ben Tulan expressed a desire to see the goblet of glass. During the examination, it was filled with water and weighed, then emptied and reweighed. The historian wrote that it was found to be of the same weight when empty as when full of water. For something so ancient, Egypt's mysteries, you know, the stuff we've seen in movies and books, the pyramids, the tombs, the sphinx, it, it never seems to stop amazing the modern mind, right? Well, there's new research now that's suggesting that there may be some new discoveries still to be made, maybe underground, right? Is this the real riddle of the sphinx? The study of the majesties of ancient Egypt goes back to the founding of Western science and archaeology. And while most of the major monuments along the Nile have been found and explored, there is no shortage of strange theories about their origins. Take for example the Sphinx. New research suggests there's a secret tunnel underneath the statue connecting it to one of Egypt's largest pyramids. At the very front of the Sphinx there is the Dream Stealer, uh, which is a, you know, a, plinth, a worm, a stone plinth, which has got uh, writings on it by Tutmos IV, the guy who excavated the Sphinx in the 18th dynasty. And on that on that stele, we've got two pictures of the Sphinx. But on those pictures, they've got it's sort of sitting on a plinth, and underneath it looks like there's a doorway. So where is the pushback coming from? According to Matt Sibson, it's coming from within academic circles, and that's despite interesting new scientific discoveries. The general consensus, the sort of the official word, is there is nothing underneath the Sphinx. So. Are controversial theories with evidence to support them being pushed aside for academic or tourist agendas? Reporting in Washington, D.C., Joseph Ricci, RT. Interestingly, during the 10th century, a writer by the name of Musaudi claimed that advanced mechanical statues were guardians of the subterranean galleries located under the Great Pyramid of Giza. He wrote, Written accounts of wisdom and acquirements in the different arts and sciences were hidden deep that they may remain as records for the benefit of those who could afterwards comprehend them. This reminded me of the Hall of Records referred to by Edgar Cayce, who once said an ancient library exists under the Great Sphinx of Giza, built by the survivors of Atlantis. Edgar Cayce was a self-professed clairvoyant who answered questions on subjects while in a trance state. When asked about the time near the end of the days of Atlanteans, Cayce explained, There came the first aggressive people to the Pyrenees and into what later became the Egyptian dynasties. While I can't speak to Edgar Cayce's psychic abilities, I can say that I found the genetic affinities interesting between the ancient Basque, which are the people who live on the Pyrenees, between France and Spain, where Cro-Magnon was discovered, and who are among the highest percentage of RH negative people in the world, and the North African Caucasian natives, such as the Berber tribes who live near Mount Atlas, as well as the Caucasian natives called Guanches on the islands off the west coast of Africa in the Atlantic called the Canary Islands who also left mummies and small stone pyramids. 
For those interested, I did a video on this, which I will include a link to in the description. One of Casey's most controversial claims was that of polygenism, which postulates that the human races are of different origins. This view is opposite to the idea of monogenism, which favors a single origin of humanity. Modern mainstream academia no longer favors the polygenetic model, with the monogenetic out-of-Africa hypothesis being the most widely accepted model for human origins. The reason is because polygenism is thought to advance racial inequality, specifically the concept of diffusionism, which means that one particular race introduced agricultural civilization to the rest of the world. The problem with the out-of-Africa hypothesis is that during the last decade or so, there has been a revolution in the field of genetics, with the sequencing of the genome, not only of modern Holocene humans, but of several archaic hominin species, which conclusively proves that present-day humanity is comprised of various different species that, in an anthropological terms, are several million years removed from each other. For example, this specimen is of a girl who had a Neanderthal mom and Denisovan dad. When I was in school earning my own degrees in anthropology, I was told by my professors that this was impossible, the same way that humans cannot mate with chimpanzees. Yet DNA has demonstrated otherwise and continues to do so. In this example, scientists claim that modern Sub-Saharan Africans particularly those with ancestry from West Africa, contain up to 19% DNA from a super archaic species, meaning over a million years removed from modern humans. This ghost species doesn't appear in the DNA of modern day Asians or modern day Caucasians, and was likely from Homo habilis or erectus, but has not yet been identified in the fossil record. To give you an idea of what that means, Hominins allegedly started walking upright only 5 million years ago. Of course, this still has not yet been proven in the fossil record, as Lucy and others of her kind, which lived around 3.4 million years ago, had an opposable big toe, meaning it resembled a thumb for clinging to branches and climbing trees, not bipedalism. Humanity is comprised of various upright walking hominins, none of which have been demonstrated to have come down from the trees at any period in prehistory, which is why no matter how politically inconvenient it may be to modern global agendas, theories concerning Atlantis by mediums like Edgar Cayce or other occult authors like Madame Helena Blavatsky, who also denounced out-of-Africa theory, are still plausible given that DNA sequencing has debunked the idea of the replacement model. In nature, roughly 10% of all animals are hybridized between two different species, while some incorrectly assume that the ability to produce viable hybrid offspring indicates that the parents must be of the same species. This reasoning is obsolete, as DNA has revealed that specimen with different number of chromosomes indicating that they are distinct species can and do interbreed. One example being the howler monkeys of Tabasco, Mexico, which I've covered before in my books and videos, and one can freely look up for themselves online. That said, according to Casey, the different human races had been created separately on different parts of the earth. Casey also accepted the existence of aliens and that the red race from Atlantis developed rapidly. Many have misunderstood the term red race to mean modern Native Americans, which did not occupy the Americas during the Pleistocene, or Ice Age. The red race implies Cro-Magnon and its descendants, which would mix red ochre with animal fat to create a paint that they would apply to their skin. This is evident by cave paintings from the Ice Age, as well as red ochre covered burials of Cro-Magnon and its ancestors. The practice has also come down to the ancient Egyptians, who are depicted red in their art, despite their blonde and red-headed mummies having had white skin. 
The same can be said about the ancient Phoenicians, ancient Minoans, Etruscans, and red-skinned Native Americans who are now extinct, but whose ancient DNA has been shown to have genetic affinities with ancient Basque people who have had transatlantic contact the entire duration of the Holocene, called Maritime Archaic, or Red Paint People. Another claim by Casey is that various races intermingled on Earth to produce giants that were as much as 12 feet tall, which is also mirrored in parts of the Bible, as well as mythology from around the world, including the ancient Greeks. I have covered this topic in a video I made about giants, which I'll leave a link to in the description. Skeptics say that Casey's alleged psychic abilities were fakery or non-existent, which may or may not be the case. What I can speak to is the fossil and genetic record, and can now say that it's clear that the alleged out-of-Africa hypothesis is what has been shown to be politically motivated, fakery, and scientifically non-existent. I decided to stop for a bite at Makoto Sushi in Encino, California, which is known for having many unique specialty roles, and the staff that work here are always a lot of fun. I haven't been here for a while because they were temporarily closed during the shutdowns, but things seem to be back to normal now. I asked my waitress to bring me something that suits my personality and style, and she recommended the pendejo roll which must be some sort of compliment in Spanish. I told her that I would give it a try, and I'm very glad that I did. I also had albacore sushi, a shrimp tempura and unagi freshwater eel roll, and of course the pendejo, which is hot cooked white fish, and I highly recommend it. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.